Superintendent Perry, are we ready for the reports? Perry, I'm going to turn the next section to Superintendent Perry for the report section, starting with reports, ready to school, safe learners, return to school update. All right, so we have um, quite a lengthy detailed presentation, uh, just because we think it's really important for you to understand uh, the details related to getting kids back in person, and also some of the challenges within the system. I was thinking about it uh, last night as we stopped a system and redirected uh, resources. Now, as we come into in-person learning, we have to think about how do we shift the system back in a very different way that we've never um, really experienced before because we haven't um, done a system like this that's hybrid and the transportation challenges and a number of others. So we thought it was really important to update you with where we are, um, how we're thinking about things, some of the safety protocols, and um, so you can get a really um, important look at um, the things we're working towards. So with that, I believe um, I'm starting with um, Dr. Sproles. And how about if after um, we just take, well, I'm trying to think, how do you want to do questions tonight, Chair Chandra Gary? You want to wait till the end? Yeah, we'll, let's wait till the end and then we can, we can do like one question each and then we can do okay. make sure everybody gets a chance. Okay, all right. Dr. Sproles, I think you're first. Thank you, Superintendent Perry and Board Chair Chandra Gary and board members. We are excited to be able to share um, a lot of information tonight about our return to school plans and some updates. And we hope that this will start a dialogue that will continue on for the next several weeks between our parents and our school leaders to find out more about what a hybrid model will look like starting with our K-5 students and then working up from there. So before we jump in, I, I just wanted to let you know that, so tonight I'll be talking for the first few slides and then Chief Mike Wolf will talk a little bit about some of the safety protocols that we're implementing and some structural changes that we've made to our facilities in relation to those safety protocols. And then Dr. Udosanata will be talking about secondary and our plans because there's a lot of interest in, well, now that we have an elementary plan rolling, those of you that have middle and high students, as I have a high school student as well, wondering about what the next steps are. So we don't wanna leave people hanging and we will address those as well. So um, as Superintendent Perry stated, it's a relatively lengthy uh, presentation with a lot of information as we go through. So before we start, I just wanted to revisit our considerations for when we decided to move toward a, toward a hybrid model. We have great news right now about our countywide data. So though, those of you who are somewhat obsessed with our COVID data like I am, and I think Director Bethel as well checks that site many times a day, um, you probably have already know that our numbers continue to decline. For the first time in the last seven weeks, we're below 300 cases per 100,000, and we, we continue a downward trend. And I think that's really a testament to the citizens of Marion County and Polk County and their commitment to maintain what we know works, which is physical distancing, facial coverings, reducing large gatherings, and hand washing. And you're gonna hear that same theme a lot tonight because that's what the research tells us what works. So, but when we decided to go to a hybrid model, we still wanna keep in mind our countywide data, but we're also gonna focus more on school specific data. We now have the ability to look at what do COVID cases look like in a specific neighborhood and related to a specific school setting. So the countywide data is one kind of large aggregate data point, but it doesn't tell the whole picture. So we will be focusing on school specific data as well. Part of that is, we need to ensure that our safety protocols are firmly in place. We have protocols that will keep students and staff safe, and we need to make sure that they're being followed in all of our learning settings and across all of our organization. And we'll talk a little bit today about how we're going to ensure that they are followed. We also need to maintain really strong collaboration with Marion and Polk counties. They are the drivers to be able to help us interpret the data and make ongoing decisions related to keeping schools open and then expanding services to other groups of students. Our access to vaccinations was a key 
um, additional layer that staff could choose to opt into to provide additional security and one more step towards keeping them safe um, from COVID when they do return to work. And then also we've had COVID-19 um, testing availability. And this was part of the governor's um, speech when she came out in December and talked about that. And so we're moving forward with the ability to rapidly test symptomatic people who come to school, be that students or staff. So I think it's important and I am not good at times at just taking a breath and celebrating where we are, because I think it's we are moving forward with a hybrid model that we originally started talking about in June. And we spent a lot of time and energy focusing on this model, hoping for an August launch. And then our numbers went high, the metrics changed, and we weren't able to be able to do this until right now. So I think it's important for us to recognize what has gotten us to this point. And I loved the spotlights tonight because I, I should just play all of them instead of say all of this because they're evidence of the way that our community has really tried hard with an equity lens to be able to reach all of our students. We've done that by providing access. We've done that by teachers going the extra mile for our students every single day. We've done that by doing home visits and making sure that people have access to essential things like food and clothing during this pandemic. So the equity focus has driven a lot of the way that we've responded as a district. We've established really strong relationships with our labor unions and we continue in to have almost daily conversations with union members and union leaders to be able to make sure that we're crafting a plan that works. A key part that a lot of time goes unseen is that we've maintained operational consistency from when the pandemic first struck. And so we've maintained transportation efficiency. We've dropped off meals throughout our community. We've maintained food service serving over um, 2 million meals and continuing to serve students and families with meals, a custodial service, maintenance staff. All those people have been keeping our organization running while we prepare for this moment in time. And so they've allowed us to launch this moment. We've also had extremely successful preschool programs, limited in-person and home visits. We were on the cutting edge of offering in-person supports for our students compared to most other school districts around the state. And our ability to do that gave us an ability to test our safety systems. So our preschool promise teachers, our Head Start teachers, um, they've been, they were some of our essential childcare workers that were working back April. <laughs> They've been working with kids since, since we've um, been in CDL as an organization. We also have thousands of educators that are working tirelessly to make CDL work, which is important because as we'll discuss today, just because we're in hybrid doesn't mean that we still don't have CDL supports for students. We need to have both simultaneously. I mentioned our strong relationships. Uh, Superintendent Perry, did you have something to add? Yeah, I just wanted to add that the the um, way we have really used uh, limited in-person instruction has prepared us for this moment. Like we have practiced, we have practiced, and I think that's really important to recognize all the safety protocols through limited in-person. We cannot, you know, if we could go back and do it again, we'd do it just like we did because we practiced. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And that gave us an opportunity to try out the protocols that were on paper, but we hadn't actually tried them with kids in the building. And so we've had kids in every single one of our buildings um, supporting students. And so it gave us a chance to do that really, really well. And then I think we can't lose sight of our 42,000 students and all of their families that have been supporting their learning and all of our educators that have been walking alongside them during this journey. So I think it's an important time for us to just take a collective breath and realize that there's a lot of things that have gotten us to this point. Um, and we have a lot to be proud about for that, for the way our system is now ready to, um, ready to launch for a hybrid model. So here's some hopeful research that um, has been coming out just in the last couple of weeks about reopening schools. And I thought I would just touch on a handful of these and then we will have links to these on our website as well with the actual citations. The American Academy of Pediatrics conducted a study in North Carolina um, focusing on North Carolina schools. The schools were actually open during a, high, a time of high COVID transmission within the state. 
they found that they had a, a sample size of 100,000 students and staff in a, in a large school system. There were 32 cases of transmission and all of the cases were student to student. None of the cases were student to staff that they were able to document in their study. CDC did a similar study in Wisconsin. And again, the Wisconsin County that they chose to study was one that was in extreme COVID um, high numbers like numbers like we've never even seen in Oregon before. And they, they decided to reopen schools in a targeted way. They focused specifically on, and here's the theme again, masks, physical distancing, cohorting, and hand washing. When those protocols were followed and, they, and these set of schools followed them really carefully and closely, there were only seven cases that spread throughout the four months that they used as a study trial period for the CDC. The New England School of Medicine and Journal of Medicine is a, um, they've done a lot of studies on the vaccine to be able to see whether they're effective or not. And the, the rate of um, effectiveness for the vaccines are coming out surprisingly high. Most um, flu vaccines are in the 70 or 80% and our COVID-19 vaccines that we are um, using are in the 90s to 95%. So that's good data as well. Again, I just wanna reiterate, people aren't required to get the vaccine, but it is an additional layer um, of um, support that we've offered our staff. And then finally, we have a lot of our SKPS localized data and we've had strong implementation of protocols and we know that we're, we are going to have COVID-19 in our schools. We have it in our communities. It's in, when you go to the grocery store, it's at the grocery store with people that are interacting with you at the grocery store and it will be brought into our schools. And it has been brought into our schools this fall, but we've used our processes and our protocols to identify, isolate and quarantine when that does happen to minimize spread and then get those students back in the classroom. So again, the, the, as Superintendent Perry alluded to, the limited in-person practice rounds that we've been able to have to practice our procedures have proved to be very, very successful. And we have our systems in place. So I believe this is Chief Wolf. <laughs> Thanks, Craig. I appreciate the uh, promotion. Uh, <laughs> Uh, good evening. Uh, so tonight I just have three slides um, and I wanted to start off with, as um, both Superintendent Perry and um, Craig has said, we've been preparing for this for a long time. Um, we have been planning and planning and planning. We've gone through several iterations of the Ready School Safe Learners um, and the, the latest iteration has given us um, the direction we need <clears throat> to move forward in a few key areas. And one is that we were able to strengthen our on-site accountability. And so um, we've always had a physical distancing coordinator in place. And um, we've strengthened that uh, by adding the safety and health piece as well. So we've got, we've updated all of our internal documents. We've got the training uh, protocols in place and we have our physical distancing and safety coordinator. We've added a liaison position as an additional layer of protection as well. Remember, there's the, um, there's the reporting of violations of safety protocols, and that's really important. Weaves right into our safety committees, which have been in place forever. They're, um, you know, our connection to OSHA and OSHA requirements and in the RSSL, OSHA is obviously the lead agency with respect to health and safety um, protocols and requirements. And so our safety committees, we've updated manuals, uh, we've updated checklists, we've updated responsibilities. Uh, we have the reporting um, protocols in place. We also have an anonymous QR code for um, individuals who feel that um, that would be the better way to identify issues. And that goes directly to our safety and risk management department so that we're constantly monitoring and tracking the uh, situations in our, in our buildings. We also have the, the training for staff and students. Now remember, uh, yes, we have expanded in Lippy, and um, we're about ready to scale up in our elementary schools. And so we'll have more kids and we'll have more staff together than we've had before. And that's going to take, we're gonna to have to settle in. And uh, we've got the protocols in place. We've talked about them uh, forever, right? You've heard this over and over and over again. It becomes real 
really quick uh, when we move into hybrid. And that's what we, we've got to get through that first cycle of uh, operationalizing all of the, the planning uh, as we scale up. And so that's where, so we've got new protocols uh, in place. Imagine that the last time um, as a student, you were in the school, how long ago that was. And now you're gonna come in and things are gonna look significantly different. There'll be different restrictions on movement throughout the building. Um, <clears throat> common areas won't be areas that you can be common in anymore, right? You can't congregate in these areas. Uh, gymnasiums will be used for different things. Cafeterias, you may not see one for lunch, you know, for a while. Uh, and then libraries, probably not going to be used in exactly the same way. Playgrounds are going to look the same, but, you know, there'll be different restrictions uh, on them. So it's just really important for us that I think training is absolutely essential for staff and students. And part of it is we've got to do it and we're ready. I guess our message is. I've been ready for a long time. Okay, um, so there's lots and lots of questions about filtration and um, ventilation. So I wanted to, I'm not gonna give you the, the 101 on um, HVAC, but in case you're interested, it's heating, ventilation and cooling. There's not a whole lot of cooling in a lot of buildings, but those, let me put it to you this way. If you're in a building or, or our brand new spaces with the bond and you can't open a window, that's usually a good indication that you have a central HVAC system. Okay. All of our systems are tuned and they've been retuned for maximum outside air pulling in and uh, a refresh rate in each uh, space of approximately three to four times per hour. So a lot of people are interested in, you know, what's going on with our, our filtration systems. Um, we can spend a lot more time on this. We're not going to tonight, but uh, just wanted to give you um, kind of a sense uh, we do know through the risk assessment and mitigation process, for instance, when you're assessing risk, if you can eliminate it, you do. As Craig said, we can't eliminate the virus, but we can mitigate it and we can manage through it. And that's what a lot of our protocols are intended to do. So um, we have identified areas for portable um, HEPA air filtration systems. And through the risk process, we've identified our special education self-contained classrooms. We, we will be um, putting the HEPA filtration systems in there to help. It doesn't mean that the ventilation in the, the buildings that they're in isn't working. This is an additional mitigation um, step. We'll also be looking at um, our isolation rooms in each uh, building, because remember when um, kids get uh, sick or, or are presenting symptoms, our protocols are to uh, move them into the isolation room for uh, further analysis. Um, and then uh, we're also looking at staff rooms. We know that staff rooms are really important. And so we'll be putting um, air filtration systems in there as well. And um, front offices, primarily because there's just a lot of movement. There's, you know, that's, it's one of the busiest areas, one of the busiest places um, in the school. Just to give you a sense of scale, uh, we're spending currently um, a little over $400,000 on the filtration systems themselves and the filters. Um, we're also, you know, the disinfecting wipes. Now remember, the RSSL has uh, sort of tightened up on disinfecting and we're there. We've spent uh, approximately 1.5 million on PPE, including additional disinfectant wipes for every classroom. So there'll be a tub a big tub, not the ones you buy in the store, um, of disinfectant wipes uh, in every classroom. Remember, the most effective uh, means of combating COVID is hand washing, face coverings, and physical distancing. It's not hand washing and disinfecting your hands, right? So by disinfecting, we're going above what would be a normal process. Um, and we've got all of the supplies uh, in place and on order because uh, the other thing to remember is everyone in the world literally is looking for the same stuff at the same time. So you've got to get in the queue. Um, and I will say that uh, <clears throat> Dave Hughes and his team over at Auxiliary Services and Purchasing are, are uh, doing a phenomenal job keeping us in the queue for the supplies. And then we have the COVID-19 rapid antigen testing. 
This is required to offer uh, for any symptomatic individual, staff or student in each school if uh, we're above the 350 per 100,000 or we're in the transition uh, category, which we are now, which is between the 200 and um, 350 per 100,000. So we, we're centralizing the process uh, through our district health authority uh, so that even though it's a self-administered test, we also know that um, we need to be um, uh, controlling and monitoring the actual process of the test. There's huge reporting requirements. Um, and we also wanna make sure, I mean, you know, when you're thinking about a five or six or seven year old, um, you know, and, and, and we have consent, you know, uh, we wouldn't uh, allow this to happen without parental consent. Um, that it may not be the easiest thing in the world for them to do. And we wanna make sure that we've got systems and processes in place um, so that it can be done correctly and can be reported uh, to OHA accordingly. And so uh, we'll be um, implementing this process. It'll be through our district health authority. It'll be a school-based process with support from uh, the district. We also have our communication protocols in alignment with the newest version of the RSSL. And that's for every positive case, whether it's staff or students, we send out a communication directly to the parents uh, of the school uh, and to all staff so that uh, everyone is informed. And as Craig said, <clears throat> we have COVID that enter our buildings and we have systems and processes in place. We have our COVID-19 response team uh, that kicks in. We have our um, custodial uh, cleaning and disinfecting uh, teams that will move in um, when necessary to take care of the situations. What we like to think about is um, we get sick, people get sick, our buildings don't. And so our process is to remove the illness, isolate, quarantine, um, and then get our buildings back up for use as quick as safely possible. All right, and then the last uh, slide are just some operational challenges and opportunities. So our transportation department's do, been doing, they've, all of the operations uh, side of the house has been doing just a phenomenal job. As Christy said earlier, everybody in the district has, but I get to talk about operations right now. So um, our transportation department, we're, you know, throughout this whole uh, situation, we didn't lay off any employees. We, we kept all of our bus drivers and we kept them actively engaged. Uh, they're moving 5,000 meals a day, five to 6,000 meals a day. We've turned SeaTech into a major food production and distribution center. And if you, you wanna see synchronized driving and loading, you should come by SeaTech and watch, uh, watch that operations. Um, so uh, our so we're, we're ready to support the pre-K five hybrid um, and that includes all of our students with special needs K-12. So when we talk about moving into hybrid, transportation is ready to make that happen. Um, they're already, and also support secondary limited in-person instruction. Um, they're very close to uh, telling us when they would be able to support the full K-12 hybrid. We just didn't have all the analysis done tonight to be able to say that, but, um, it's transportation, so my sense is they'll figure out a way to make it happen, quite frankly. The grab and go meals, um, just a slight correction, we're, we're pushing about 1.3 million um, meals at this point. Um, and there'll be a trade off because there's about 50, 48 or 50 uh, meal distribution sites that transportation takes into the neighborhoods. So as we transition into moving more kids to school, we will transition out of moving more meals into neighborhoods, right? And so when, when we go full hybrid, um, well, the kids will be in school, right? So that's where the meals are uh, generally. Uh, but we wanted to make sure that you understood the trade-off that we'll be heading into and we'll keep you informed in the community informed along the way as well. And then the last piece is classroom capabilities. Our elementary schools are all set for hybrid. So we could do it today, we're not, but we could do it today. And the classrooms are set. We're moving into um, secondary as we speak with a focus on 
high schools and then following up with middle schools and reconfiguring every classroom for the maximum amount of kids that we can put in safely given the RSSL guidance. And that's what I have for operations. All right. Hey, Chair Chandra Geary, would you be interested in taking a few questions right now before we, we're going to move into elementary schedules and secondary is what's still coming up, but that's up to you. We can keep going or you can. No, I think it, let's take a few questions and kind of go around and make sure we don't miss anybody. Uh, so we'll start with Director Lippold. Do you have a, one question? So we can go make sure everybody gets around. Uh, I'm just trying to process a lot of the information. That was a lot of all once. All right. Sure Thank I'll, you. I'll give them to you later. Vice Chair Beto. I do have one question for Mr. Wolf about those meals. Um, so it's no secret that our kids have always had a need for food at home. And you guys have done such a remarkable job with the grab and goes and letting kids take extras to be able to kind of fill in that gap at home. Is the plan when they when they come back, yeah, I know it's just hybrid, so two days a week right now to start with, how will they be able to supplement the meals at home on the days they're not in school? And then on the days they are in school, will they be able to take meals home in the event that they need meals at home? Because I'm sure we all know that just because we're going back to school doesn't mean everybody's going back to work. Right, right. Yeah. Um, great question. So basically when you come in, uh, that day, you'll grab the meal for that day. And when you go home, you'll grab the meal for the next day. Does that make sense? So you're, you're in, you grab the meals for the day that you're in. When you're leaving, you grab the meals uh, for the next day that you won't be there. And uh, we will continue as long as ODE allows this program to continue. Um, we'll still have grab and go at the front of every school that is in hybrid. So it'll be kids coming in grabbing meals. The logistics are going to be challenging. Kids coming in grabbing meals, kids leaving, taking meals home, and then from 10 to one or 11 to one, uh, grab and go for the community. Thank you. So the community, okay, the community component I think is what I missed. So thanks for mentioning that. There is going to be that in addition for parents to come and, and support if need be, and get support if they need it as long as ODE allows the, this feeding program to continue. Okay, I hear you, thank you. Director Hyen, do you have a question? No, no question. Director Goss. Is the uh, space bar the unmute or is there a separate? Okay. Do, do you want to type in in the chat and I can, I can't hear, and I can read it aloud? Dr. Goss, I can't hear you because you're still muted. If I could offer a suggestion, Director Goss, just press your space bar and that should unmute, but hold it down while you want to talk. Okay. Keep it pressed, hold it down, space bar. Oh, there you are. Go ahead now. Oh no. Director Goss, I can't hear you. There's a all right. There may be an issue with the with their settings that okay. can, I can walk her through. All right, Director Goss, 
will have somebody call you or text you and see how to kind of help you reset the settings. So I'd like to see if we can go to Director Kylo and then we'll. No questions. Director Blasi. Advisor Mabinton, do you have a question? I can't hear you. You're to unmute. Oh, you have no question? No questions, just processing all of the information. Thank you very much. Now, I have a question, Mr. Bulb. Uh, a lot of these children who have to take meals home, you know, their families also may not be having, you know, they may also be going through food scarcity. Is there a way to tie up with some Marian Pope food share or some other kind of nonprofit so that you can use the same system of distribution to kind of give them a backpack full of food on, when they go home maybe once a week. So that the family and perhaps the siblings who are not in school also can. I mean, using the same infrastructure, our transport, et cetera. Um, yeah, you know, we, uh, that's a great question. We really engaged in that in a big way early on in the spring and expanded um, our site, multiple sites actually. Um, we've actually talked to the food share uh, recently within the last month or so. They're not in a position currently uh, to do that, um, but that doesn't mean that they wouldn't be in the future. We have to be, uh, logistically, it's um, obviously it's doable. It's also something that we have to be very careful and separate our food service with that food service. And so, um, the best thing I can say right now is I know that some of the pantries that were closed are now open, like Four Corners was our first partnership because the pantry right next uh, to Four Corners was closed, but it's open again. So I think the best thing that we could do is help communicate the locations um, for the food services with Marion Polk Food Share. I was hoping that all agencies could collaborate and using the same infrastructure of distribution uh, to make sure rather than having to duplicate distribution, right? Mm -hmm. So that just a thought came to my head, sorry. Uh, just okay. to, so that we can align all the different agencies to work around food scarcity. That's the reason I brought this. Right, if you kind of gone through one round of questions, I don't think I missed anyone. Director Goss needs some technical assistance. So, are we, let's go through the rest of the presentation and then we'll go back to round two of questions. And I'm gonna see if um, Bob can get the number from Alice and call Kathy. I think it's a set. Already working on it. Thank you. Okay, so ready to jump into talking a little bit more specifically about the elementary day. And then Dr. Dosanata will finish up with talking secondary as well. So I have about three slides and then, um, then he'll jump in. So here's our timeline for when we are going to implement our hybrid model. All of our elementary staff, so our licensed and classified staff will begin working on the 22nd. We will offer our first day of hybrid learning for K-1 and elementary self-contained classrooms on March 2nd and that will be a big day for us. That will be a big day. We will, I can commit to the school board, we'll bring some pictures mm -hmm. of kids walking in the doors on that day to be able to celebrate uh, collectively that day. Then on the 9th, um, grades two and three will start hybrid. On the 16th, grades four, five will start hybrid with the goal of having our elementary schools in hybrid before spring break. And we've had a couple questions on why not stagger it longer and wait until after spring break for some grade levels. This was a decision made by our, our school-based team to be able to get in before spring break, gives us a week of spring break to analyze our processes and protocols to be able to see how things went before we welcome K-5 back on the 30th. So that was actually a tactical decision. We, did, we had similar things um, when we were right before winter break. And it, we, we, it, we found it was to our advantage to be able to use that time to reflect before launching again. So that's why the, that system is set up that way. And then on the 30th, we start K-5 and we will be moving uh, for, forward with that until the end of the school year. 
And can I just make one clarification on the all staff return? We are doing a bit of staggering of staff because remember, as we have our K-1 starting in hybrid, our other grade levels are still in CDL. So they're navigating that. Um, we're encouraging people to get in when they can, but they're also navigating that they've set up a home workspace as they transition back. So thank you for that, Superintendent Perry. And, and I think it's important to note that for like our two, three and four, five teachers, they're gonna to continue to teach in CDL as we're bringing our K-1 teachers back. So be able to allow them to do that at their in their home stations, which are set up for that right now before transitioning back because we didn't wanna create a double transition. So thank you for noticing that. So, this is just a snapshot and we've, we've gotten a few questions from board members and from community members about what does a week look like in the life of a hybrid model. So this is, this is a little bit of that week. So on Mondays, Mondays are gonna look very similar to what they currently do. Um, families could expect some targeted small group instruction. Most of that at the start will be digitally. We won't be bringing in a lot of kids for that targeted instruction to start partially because of the transportation requirements to be able to do that on a Monday and set up routes for that. Parents and family supports could be prearranged by the teacher, just like right now, teachers can reach out to families that need extra support on Mondays. And then there will be PE and music asynchronous activities for families to participate with their students on Monday. On Tuesday, let's say this is for a student and she has, this is a Tuesday, Thursday student. And so this is what her schedule would look like. Um, let's say she's a first grader at Swiegel. So um, at, she would come to school, she'd um, get her breakfast like Mr. Wolf discussed. We'd take attendance, we'd do some social emotional learning. We'd always concentrate on reading and writing because we know that's an essential skill for our, for our youngest learners. There would be recess breaks throughout the day and movement breaks built in throughout the day. So kids can move, they can do brain breaks, they can do brain gym activities in the classroom. There could, can be movement throughout the day. I think we have this vision of a five or six year old sitting in her desk um, for five hours straight. And that's, that's not what's gonna actually happen. Um, and then we would have some language development. We would have lunch and recess. Um, and then we would have art and science or health, kind of in a, um, depending on what the teacher wants to teach during that time. And then there will be some time devoted at the very end of the day to prepare for at home learning because the next day she's going to be at home all day. So the next day the student would engage in some social emotional activities. The student will have a PE lesson or a music lesson or both. Um, there could be interventions for students who need extra support. All of PE music and the interventions could be synchronous. And so there could be a time, let's say this student says that she needs to log in at 8.30 uh, to meet her PE teacher for an activity. She stays on at 9.15, she gets a music lesson at that time. And then she stays on at 10.30 to be able to get a reading intervention because she needs a little leg up to be able to um, get back on grade level for her reading. There'll also be time throughout her day to be able to complete homework that her teacher assigned from yesterday. So we're hoping that this model of teachers starting kids in the work, and then they can take it home and work, will be able to advance learning when she comes back to school on Thursday. So she'll be back in, she'll go through her regular day, teacher will prepare for the off day at home, and then she goes back on Friday and goes through that same sequence again. So this is just a little snapshot for our community and for our parents of an A day, B day schedule and the way it would impact for, for one elementary learner. And then finally, we've, we've gotten questions about, well, what happens if I want my student to remain in remote learning? I don't wanna send my student, even though my, my school is going back to hybrid, I don't wanna send my student. So it's important to note that we did have a transfer window in November and December for families that wanted to transfer to EDGE or to CDL. And we made it really clear at that time that if you are 100% sure that you don't want your student to, to come back in person, this is an opportunity to do that. And we did have families take us up on that. So we, we had a lot of families that had questions about this that have already transferred one way or the other. If a family requests to remain in remote learning, um, that family should contact their resident school administrator. So where you're currently attending school as a CDL student, contact the administrator from that school. 
The building administrator will discuss options with you, answer any questions that you might have about safety protocols. And if you are for sure that you do want to transfer from CDL, that you'll, you'll form, fill out this request to stay in remote learning form. So that then we will be able to gather those forms centrally and then we'll place students in a remote learning classroom either with an edge teacher or with a district assigned teacher. So this is a subset of, of students who don't wanna come back in hybrid, who we will continue their learning digitally in a remote format. I think it's important for, for parents though to realize most likely you will not have your current teacher because your current teacher will most likely be teaching in the hybrid model, depending on when they start. But by spring break, all of our elementary staff that are in our schools will be teaching in the hybrid model. So students would begin in their new classrooms when their grade level transitions to hybrid. So it would either be the second, the ninth, or the 16th, depending on which grade um, your student is in. Then the questions have come up, why not just transfer every student um, to EDGE, which in a, you know, in a perfect world, but we really have staffed in a certain way. Um, at the semester transition, we did leave some um, additional staff, but we just don't quite know yet the, the size, the numbers of students that will want to remain in CDL, um, especially when they understand that they won't get to stay with their teacher. So um, that's why we're gonna manage it centrally and try to be sure that we distribute class size uh, carefully across the organization as we know the numbers. Dr. Udosanata, I think you're up. Excellent. Good evening, Chair Shonda Gary, Superintendent Perry, directors of the board. Um, I'm gonna give you some updates today on what we're doing with the secondary, uh, especially with regards to limited in-person instruction and uh, our hybrid model, as well as uh, provide some updates on, on OSAA happenings, as well as music updates too. So when we last met in January and when we last provided a report in January, uh, we communicated that we were gonna focus on bringing our younger grades back into school first but we're going to expand limited in-person instruction. And if you recall, we were really ramping up uh, limited in-person instruction until we had to put a pause on it in November. And then we had to scale way back. And for instance, uh, at a school like McNary, they went from having uh, ramping up to almost having 700 to 800 students coming in for limited in-person instructional opportunities and scaling back to less than 10%. Right, and they have um, about 2000 students in their school. So we really had to put a halt to that. In the second to last week though of our, or in the last week of quarter two, we started ramping up limited in-person instruction again for our high school students. And so I, I'm gonna go be backwards a little bit here, but on our bo bottom bullet, you'll see that we served about 1500 students, which is a, an average of about um, 200 students per school, give or take. So. Again, we started scaling back up. And what our goal is to do is to really expand it to where every student will have an opportunity to have in-person instruction if they want it. And that's um, also being able to provide transportation to them too. So uh, in terms of our high school plan and how things are going with our, our limited in-person instruction, we're really prioritizing uh, targeted student groups. Uh, we're starting with, um, for instance, our self-contained programs, our, our learning resource centers, or what we call our, our LRCs for, for SPED, um, English language learners. We're targeting students who have, um, would benefit from having in-person instruction and who, we, who building leaders in the district has, has identified as struggling in CDL for one reason or another. Um, we are also uh, in third quarter going to expand our limited in person by doing a senior blitz. Right? So bringing in seniors who uh, are on the, the cusp of, of graduating, but need a little bit of additional support to get across the finish line. And then um, we're really pleased to share that we will be uh, offering limited in person instruction opportunities for our visual and performing arts, depending on the program. Um, we're going to be starting with music. And then also um, our CTEC programming, especially our, hand, our hands-on programs at CTEC, construction, for instance, um, I think cosmetology too, um, has, I've already started the process of bringing students in for limited in-person instructional opportunities. 
And so we're, we're really um, pleased that we're able to bring students in as it's a precursor for what may happen when we launch into a hybrid model or an in-person instruction model and trans, um, transition away possibly from CDL. So um, just to, to give a couple of examples of what's happening at high schools, um, McNary, for instance, uh, they're planning on serving 325 kids uh, this week, and they're doing, uh, they did a senior blitz or a, a Saturday school, and in their Saturday school, they invited 116 students, and 96 showed up for limited in-person instruction. So you can see that our, our students are eager to get in and, and, and get those in-person supports. Um, uh, if you look at McKay, they're um, consistently bringing in high numbers of students, again, uh, prioritizing those focus groups that we just that I discussed a minute ago. Um, and they have about 350 students that I think they bring that they plan to bring in this week uh, for limited in person. Um, Edge is doing limited in person instruction. Uh, they're bringing in a handful of students for alpha assessment testing. So um, our, our building leaders, I just want to give kudos to them for their creativity that they're, they're bringing to limited in person. As you can see, I focused on high school a little bit here, uh, more than the, the middle school. The middle school is also ramping up their limited in person instruction. And, and the intention is to, to double or triple the number of students that we have that we're giving limited in person opportunities to, um, with the goal of all students having an opportunity by quarter four. Okay, so I know um, a lot of our conversation for the last uh, month has been about how we're bringing back our uh, elementary students. So we do have a plan to bring back secondary students and um, I wanna give kudos to our um, secondary team over the last couple of weeks. They've been really trying to think outside the box to anticipate uh, potential constraints and how we could adjust or pr propose different models that can still help to um, bring students in school and provide um, supports that our students uh, that to create a more robust uh, educational experience for our students. So uh, one example of that is uh, our director of high school, um, Larry Ramirez, has been working with a lot of innovative leaders from the other districts to see to, to pick their brains about what's happening. I think those groups have met a couple of times to discuss what's happening and how we can be creative about bringing um, secondary in and high school in. Uh, we've also been working very closely with a handful of our, our building leaders to, to evaluate our scheduling, um, the new RSSL guidance, look at the layout of our schools and determine what we can do to bring students in given the constraints of the guidance. And so I have two models and they're, they're, they're potential models. So they're not set in stone. Um, we still have some logistics to, to iron out before we could really finalize our schedule. But here are two potential models that we have that I'd like to share with you for bringing high school or secondary students as middle and high school back to school. One is uh, the model that we've shared with you over the course um, earlier in, in August as we really started planning for bringing students back. And it's just that hybrid AB model. So an example of that would be um, group one. Uh, would come in and we were calling those cohorts, but just for the sake of not commingling the way we're using the term co cohorts, you know, group one, which would be half the school would come in on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, and they would receive uh, what are currently their CDL classes. So their, their standard classes or core classes, they would get uh, in person. And then group two would come on Wednesday, Friday with us maintaining student support days on Mondays. And on the off days, uh, students would continue to engage in applied learning. So they would do that remotely from home. Um, and we're really hoping to, to uh, with students coming in person, that they will um, have a little bit more guidance and structure around what their applied learning days will look like, even as they're at home. So uh, I want to go over the pros and cons of this model first. Uh, the pros are that we have a gradual reintroduction to school. Um, given that our students have been out of school for uh, a week, uh, we know that it's going to potentially be, um, take some, some getting used to being back in the school environment. So that, that could be a benefit for being back in school a couple of days a week instead of all day for five days straight. Um, it's a familiar instructional model in terms of being in the classroom, receiving your direct instruction from a teacher, um, being amongst uh, classmates and peers. 
Um, it's an opportunity for in-person care and connection, which is something that we know is, is um, very critical in re-entry and bringing students back to school. Um, it's an opportunity for social interaction and, and, and with both teachers and peers. And we know that our students are starved for that. So um, that is, that is uh, the, the benefits of this model. Now, um, the cons or the challenges really is the logistical constraints. Um, so I know that some parents might think or some, um, some uh, people who are watching might think, why not just bring all students in at once at the same time? And the reality is that for a high school schedule, there's a lot of logistical constraints. And I'll talk a little bit in a couple slides from now, the difference between a high school, bringing students back in high school and the complexities of that versus the elementary school. Well, they're complex, but right now for the high school, there's some logistical constraints around capacity. Remember, we have that 35 square foot rule per, per classroom, which means we could really only bring about um, somewhere on average, maybe 15 kids in a, into a classroom without, and then we'd have to be creative if we had more than that. Um, scheduling, remember kids are going back and forth uh, from one class to another instead of staying in a house cohort under, our, under this hybrid model. Um, transportation, um, and we know that our transportation is gonna be stressed. And so it takes us a little bit longer to make sure that we've ironed out all the kinks for transportation. So that's the challenge that we're, we're looking at. And then we also know that some, some students and families are just eager to get kids back full time. And so this does bring students back twice a week instead of five days a week or four days a week. Now our second and creative model, and this is again, we, we really took our secondary team to task and asked them to think outside the box um, in the case that this model right here um, in the case that we had challenges of mobilizing this um, in, by April 13th, which is the beginning of quarter four. So it's an, an applied learning, in-person applied learning model. I actually refer to it as a flipped model. Um, it's, a, it's an educational term. And what would happen is uh, we still have group one, group two, which represents half the schools. And uh, it, would be, it would be Tuesday, Thursday, and then Wednesday, Friday group. And one, day, one group would do applied learning in person. And the other group would do CDL at home the way that they've been doing it this year. So there's some consistency with that CDL process, but instead on their day off or the day away uh, from CDL, they would be going, students would be going to school. And this would be open to all students. And so you can see it's reversed for group two. So on Tuesday, Thursday, they do CDL. Wednesday, Friday, they do applied learning at school. And so here's just a description of what, that, what would be happening on those applied learning days. So again, students will come to school and, and it's open invitation, meaning all students would uh, have the invitation to attend and it would be a structured schedule as well of who's attending and where they would be. Uh, now, but there's a variety where it's a little bit more um, flexible is what the students would be doing when they arrive to their applied learning day. There'd be opportunities for what we call tier one or like our, our tier one means almost all of our students. So, or just your core coursework. So a place for students to, to engage with their coursework in a structured environment. Um, there'd be opportunities for intervention, right? Which is our tier two, tier three uh, academic supports. So this is all MTSS language. There would be um, academic and social emotional supports on site, which we think is important. Uh, again, in getting students reacclimated and, and serving all their needs and looking at the whole student. And then there would, of course, be credit recovery opportunities for students who um, perhaps didn't pass a course or fell behind um, from quarter one through quarter three. And the thing that we're really excited about is this opportunity for enrichment and engagement. And so creating opportunities for students to um, access CTE in person, art, music, PE, if possible, um, clubs. And so we really think that's a carrot that would be um, enticing to students. And so uh, the, the pros and cons of this applied learning day, the pro would be um, students get four days of engagement. So the day that they're at home during the CDL, they're engaging with their coursework remotely. So it's a blend, right? And then the other two days, uh, we know there's a variance of what student, the student experiences, but students would have that opportunity and parents would have that option to have our students attend school. Um, it's an opportunity for care and connection. 
uh, it's increased uh, supports uh, on applied learning days. And so if a student gets um, encounters a challenge or gets hung up uh, on a math problem per se, there will be somebody on site that can talk a student through it and walk them through it in person. Um, so it, it really reduces the amount of frustration. I think some of our students feel when they're online and can't, and can't really get through a problem. And of course, another pro is if there is an outbreak, there's still consistency in that CDL model should we have to uh, uh, close down parts or reduce the amount of limited in-person we're, we're uh, providing on those applied learning days should there be an outbreak. Um, and the cons is, or the challenges that, or, or criticisms might be that attendance is expected. Um, when we call students right now for limited in-person, we tell them that they really need to be there. And we have a pretty good turnout when we do that, um, but it's not required the same way that um, in terms of how attendance is being taken um, because it's an applied learning day, not a, not a class that's on the records. Uh, there are some transportation constraints and I know that our transportation department right now is running the models to see what, uh, what, we, what we're capable of doing with this. Remember, this is a new, um, this is a new learning model. So it wasn't something that they were able to prepare for in August. So there could be potential transportation constraints, but we're trying to work through that. And um, it's not clear to some of us if this will be um, a substitute for, for your standard in-person instruction. But um, we do think it is um, an upgrade from what our applied learning days look like right now. So, um, considerations for secondary. I told, I mentioned a moment ago that I was gonna talk about why it's a little bit different. And I actually touched on a lot of these points. So I will, I will go through a little, a little bit quickly. When the RSSL came out, um, the Ready School Safe Learners guidance came out on January 19th, we were hoping that there would be um, a little bit more flexibility um, with our spacing and our, and our cohorts. But as it stands right now, um, our cohorts are cohorts of 100. And our spacing is limited space or is uh, limited into 35 um, students per uh, per square foot, right? Um, so in terms of cohorts with elementary, it's a little bit more natural. They have natural cohorts uh, that are um, a little bit more practical in terms of management because they're with uh, a teacher all day, they're mostly the same students all day. Whereas we know that there's a lot of of movement with the um, secondary schedule going from period one, two, three, through, um, through five or six, right? And so um, that creates some, some stress on the master schedule. And especially with the high school, we know that a lot of the scheduling is contingent on, um, it's, it's critical because it might have graduation implications um, in the long run, right? Um, again, limited space. So uh, we're trying to work through or come up with creative solutions to, to if we reach capacity in a certain in a number of buildings. Um, remember, uh, our buildings were designed with the idea that you can fit um, 35 kids in one space. Um, but given this 35 square foot uh, restriction, um, that's going to greatly reduce the amount of students that we can house, which is why we're doing that split with the A day, B day, because we anticipated that. Um, Transportation, again, um, we're just trying to transport more students um, uh, within a building. And so there's some, and then we're also trying to do that while we're bringing back uh, our elementary kids in this new model. And again, it's um, something that our transportation department, and they're the best, they're really working on finding models that will make it work, but that's why it's a little bit slower. And again, um, access to some classes. And so we know that in the secondary, uh, that there's some classes where we don't quite have guidance yet. And that's the performing arts, for instance. Um, we're waiting for uh, ODE to update guidance on, on, um, on drama and bringing students back and also some of our musical programs as well. And so those will be impacted in the secondary hybrid model. But our next steps right here is to continue to work closely with our, our building leaders, our, our secondary leadership, and really trying to final, and of course our operations, and we will, our, our goal is to finalize a model as, as soon as we can and, and get communication out to uh, the board and to families as well. So- I'm we'll, just gonna add one thing on that too. Yeah. If, if we can figure out operationally that either model works, then we have the ability to go out and collect feedback 
on it right. and what are the pros and cons of a model. But unless we know operationally it can work, there's no reason to go out and collect models or feedback on it. So that's what that's the, the thing we're straddling um, with this is how do you um, get a model that you operationally can implement? Um, because if you think about the transportation system alone, the way we are transporting kids is different than we've ever transported um, them before with the A, B, D, and all of that. So, all right, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, no, that was, it's really important that you mentioned that. And, and I'll just say that that uh, Dave Hughes, uh, you think about all the buildings that we have and, and, and Dave Hughes uh, in our, in our uh, facilities, our facilities lead is uh, doing a great job at trying to um, really paint the picture of what we're able to do at each different facility. Remember, uh, especially for our high schools and middle schools, they're all, they were built at different times. They're configured differently. Some are under construction. And so there's, there's a lot of moving parts in terms of bringing uh, students back. Okay, so let's talk about athletics. And again, um, athletics is, is always changing. And, and we, um, we have, we have some hope that um, we're gonna we're gonna be able to to get students on um, the field of competition sometimes too, sometime soon, and so just as a refresher, uh, during the when we received the RSSL guidance in January, we learned that um, athletics was still under the ODE guidance in terms of county metrics, um, and so what that did is it it um, didn't allow us to to uh, allow our full contact sports. To um, engage to schedule their their season as soon as we wanted them to, um, but we do have a season two underway, and we're excited to share that our soccer and cross country will be beginning in February twenty second, with contests slated to begin March first. So we're excited for those uh, those athletes that have the opportunity to to um, finally get a chance to compete. Uh, they've been um, engaging in conditioning since. Uh, the fall. And so that's, that's exciting for them. Um, volleyball is uh, prohibited if a county is an extreme risk and, and right. And as it stands right now, we're starting to drop out of that extreme risk mode or uh, space in, in Marion County. So we're hopeful that uh, we may get the, the green light or approval to start uh, volleyball sooner than we thought we would a week or two ago. Um, for districts that are in the, the extreme risk category, however, we can request a change of season request form. And what that does is it allows, um, it allows our uh, district, our school, our league to shift the season to a later date so as to give greater opportunity to have an uninterrupted season with more opportunities to compete against other schools. And so that's something that our, um, our, our league uh, athletic directors could could exercise um, if we found that it would create greater opportunities for our volleyball programs. Um, as far as football goes, um, right now our football is uh, able to start non-contact conditioning practice, right? And so what that means is uh, they could go do uh, strength and conditioning, they can engage in drills, they still have to maintain the physical distancing guidelines and they can't um, en engage in full contact just yet. It's still prohibited. Now, um, Peter Weber, uh, who's the executive director from the OSAA is doing a lot of advocacy work to try to create, um, get more leniency to give our uh, football programs the ability to engage in, in full contact. But in the meantime, the OSAA board has adopted uh, a few alternatives to ensure that students might have some some way to engage in in the sport of football. So examples are seven on seven, uh, flag football, a virtual lineman challenge, or a virtual combine. Um, but do know that uh, there the OSAA um, is anticipating potential changes to guidance within the next few days. Um, for Salem Kaiser Public Schools, we are having an athletic director meeting on Wednesday. Um, to discuss how uh, all the changes um, and to discuss what our next steps could be. And um, there will also be a webinar from the OSAA and we're hopeful that they're scheduling that webinar because there's gonna be updated guidances. And so uh, we have our eyes set on the OSAA Twitter feed 
We are on their websites. We are making sure that we are staying up to date and we have our fingers crossed that uh, students um, will, our athletes will be able to participate in um, athletics when they can do so safely. So um, let me just wrap up right here with um, an update on music, um, really just music, not music and athletics. We just covered that and then go over next steps for our secondary. So um, I'm pleased to share that we're finalizing plans to bring our string and orchestra uh, programs back uh, and with band, it's percussion only. They'll begin uh, uh, operating under limited uh, in-person instruction. Uh, our orchestra and percu percussion will begin on Mondays and after school. Uh, and it depends on the, the school, uh, what, their, what their schedule will be. Um, and then also I mentioned this just a, a moment ago, ODE removed our guidance for our visual and performing arts. And so what that means is those programs are on a pause until we're able to get guidance on what the safety protocols are in order for us to have a full band and choir. And so um, we hope to get guidance soon. And I know that Stephen Lytle is just uh, waiting and he is doing everything he can. Uh, believe me, he's doing everything he can to advocate for our programs. And he will be the first to let us know when we learn something new. All right, and then finally, in terms of our elementary, um, our elementary orchestra and choir began virtually last week. And the plan as of, as of now is for those programs to remain virtually as we move back to in-person. Although those programs may start providing limited in-person instruction on those, on those student support Mondays as well. So that's it for music and athletics. Our next steps in terms of our hybrid planning for our secondary is uh, to continue doing the, the operational diagnostics uh, and working with our leadership teams to, to adjust um, depending on, on, on what the constraints are. And so we're gonna continue to plan the hybrid implementation at the secondary level. Again, um, the, the main goal is to elevate student learning opportunities. And that's to give students opportunities to come to their, their, their school and have limited in-person instruction one way or another, whether that's uh, through our ramping up of Lippy in third quarter or it's a, an applied learning day that we, we could perhaps adopt. We want kids to have in-person instruction opportunities. Uh, we're gonna continue to prioritize getting our seniors across the finish line. We wanna keep our parents looped in. Um, I'm, I'm talking to parents um, consistently and I'm getting feedback and it's giving me information on things that we need to be sharing with parents. And so we'll be working with our communication teams on that, team on that as well as our um, building principals. And um, we're gonna continue with safety upgrades and, and facility upgrades like uh, COO Wolf shared earlier today. And then um, staff, we know that staff training and professional development is, par is paramount so that we can um, confidently bring our, our educators back um, and confidently bring our students back uh, and mitigate the, the um, opportunities for a COVID outbreak. So that's, that's something that, we're, um, that I know that Chris Baldridge and our safety risk team is working hard on as well. And I think that's it. Um, Chair Chandra Gary, questions? Yeah, I think we'll follow the same format so we can kind of go around and one question that way. And uh, we'll start with uh, Director Lippold. And the way I see the screen, Director Lippold, you have a question. Uh, not right now. I mean, there's going to be a, many, a million questions, but there's nothing in stone yet for the secondary learning. And so uh, until we know a little bit more, I think I want to hold off so that way uh, right. we can be more. Thank you. Director Hyen. Yes, thank you. So you gave us an example of what uh, elementary week would look like. Um, for high school though, you said that attendance is expected but not required for the days that the student is at home. And I was curious what kind of classes they're having on those days that we would not require their attendance as if they were in school. Superintendent Perry, would you like me to answer that? Yeah, thank yep. you. So, um, so these, uh, there's a lot of, uh, I'm trying to put this into context for you, uh, uh, Director Hyen. So um, think of uh, the applied learning days almost as if it's a, um, 
like an, almost like an after school program that has several different programs and structures uh, where students can attend. And so a student uh, might come in for an applied learning day knowing that they're gonna spend a couple of hours with uh, some core instruction in the core, or working on a core instruction. Maybe you might go to some intervention and then end the day uh, doing something engaging. And because there's not a grade associated with that and it's not a standard class that's, that's logged, it's not required for attendance the same way that our, that our classes are for um, Oregon Department of Education guidelines and attendance requirements. Okay, thank you, that helps. Dr. Goss, do you have a question? Dr. Kylo, you're had to unmute. I do. Uh, my question is for both Craig and Eton. And the question is, what are the teacher responsibilities on the off days? I saw a student schedule, but I didn't see what a teacher schedule looked like. And that is troubling to me. Um, so I know we're working on an MOU tonight, but uh, so can you, either of you, both of you tell me what a teacher schedule looks like on those during, what their week schedule would look like. I get a Monday, but I don't know Tuesday through Friday. So I'll let Craig start on elementary and then I don't know if we have enough specificity yet on the teacher schedule uh, for the, for one of the secondary schedules, but go ahead, Craig. So thank you for that, Director Kylo. So the elementary day is a five hour day and this is what the MOU was agreed to um, working with SKEA. And so what that will look like for the teachers on the day that they're teaching, they will be instructing their in-person classes, um, which is half of their, their classes in person um, on, let's say a Tuesday, they'll repeat that lesson on a Wednesday, to, then they'll have a new lesson on Thursday, repeat that lesson to the second group of kids on Friday. When the kids are at home, and so they're not in person in front of that teacher, they will have lessons from the PE and music teachers who will be delivering all of their coursework on the not on the at home learning day. They'll also be um, finishing work that is assigned when they're in person with the teacher, but the teacher won't be directly monitoring that work because she will be teaching or he would be teaching the new cohort right. um, while that while that day is going on. So, so, who, so who are they working with? What's that? So who are they working with at that time? Um, on their at-home day, they'll be working with the PE teacher, the music teacher, right. possibly some classified people if they need extra intervention support. Counselors as well will be doing support groups around SEL touch points is on that day. And then they'll be completing um, asynchronous applied learning um, activities similar to what we have now. Okay. Dr. Blasi, do you have a question? Wait a minute, Secretary. Real quick for the secondary, sorry, um, and I'll be quick. Uh, so if we went under our the, the block CDL, the, the hybrid model that we've been sharing all year long, the teacher's schedules would look the same as they are now. Um, so teachers would be teaching and instructing both days um, and consistent with the schedule that they have now. Now we can be, cre uh, our schedules right now are looking at very creative ways to, to make it a possibility to, uh, to um, to work to adjust the student cohorting um, so that there might be more availability for a teacher um, during the applied learning days, but we don't have those details worked out just yet. So that, that was my question is yeah. who's working with the students on those days, the, their, their applied learning day? Yep, um, there, would, there would be, there would be uh, staff at the building. So, and those staff would be IAs um, and licensed teachers as well. And so, um, and it depends on what the space looks like. So for instance, if we have a uh, cafeteria at Parrish um, that ha that's able to house students for um, core study time, um, there doesn't necessarily have to be a lot of li or li a licensed staff in there um, because it's an applied learning day and it's not instruction. It's not direct instruction for like, teaching. And so we can have an IA in there supporting, um, whereas uh, at the same time, and here's where we don't have the specificity that Dr. or that uh, Superintendent Perry spoke of, uh, is to what extent can we free, um, uh, manage the schedules so that we can have um, our teachers available to support kids um, and what their capacity might be that day. 
And I think the important thing is um, on the secondary side is we figure out what are the operational challenges, what are the, um, if both can work, you know, what are the best, um, what's the best schedule, and then really work to be sure that we're uh, thinking carefully through the uh, teacher lens, which we've got really um, strong uh, collaboration with SKEA um, to bring teacher teams together when we get to that place, which is exactly what happened with elementary. And that happened before we could communicate um, schedules um, to parents because we had to really think about what does the day look like and how is it doable for our educators as well. And my corollary question is, have we actually done the study to make sure that we can fit, that our classes will hold 15 kids with 35, yeah, 36 the, feet yeah, we're finalizing that. shifts? Mm -hmm. I was going to yeah. say, I think having been in those classrooms, I think that's an optimistic look. Mm -hmm. That's what we're worried about. We've done some initial, um, we have some initial planning assumptions, but we're now going out classroom by classroom to figure that out. And you've identified the exact um, issue at secondary um, where the elementary classrooms are just um, a little easier set up for uh, this hybrid model and the 35 square feet. Thank you, it's yep. good. Dr. Blasi, do you have a question? Thank you. Um, Ethan, you mentioned um, needed interventions. How are, how do we know right now when kids are coming back, what those needed interventions are? Because one of the things I'm hearing is just, you know, as, as everyone is, um, you know, just the struggles with where kids are right now and feeling as though they're significantly behind. Um, is there gonna be some time allowed to try to figure out what interventions are actually needed and how to proceed? Um, because it sounds like we're, you know, we're just gonna to continue to roll right into lessons and, um, but how are they gonna, are they gonna be able to stop and kind of assess and regroup no, that's a, that's a, uh, yeah, Director Blasi, that's a good question. So here's just three real quick bullet responses. One is we'll use our, uh, our multi-tiered uh, system support, so our MTSS model to identify students who need intervention, and that's what we've always used. Uh, we'll continue to use data teams to analyze student work, to analyze uh, what student needs are, um, which are already established and structured. And importantly, um, our, our quarter two just ended. So now we have data from our first quarter, our second quarter, and we'll, we're continuing to, to monitor our student progress through formatively throughout those quarters. And so um, you'll find when we do our, our KPI report that uh, our building leaders have systems in place to identify what student needs are. Um, we're also maximizing a lot of our staffing that we, we, we receive from our SIA in terms of our um, community outreach specialists to make sure we're touching base with students to see what their social and emotional needs are in addition to what their academic needs are. Thank you very much. Uh, advisor Mabinton, do you have a question? Um, my question was the same as Director Blasi. And also, um, I'm interested to see how this plays out. Um, I know we don't have a lot of information on secondary, um, but elementary looks pretty good. Um, I'm excited to see how that plays out coming up. All right. Thank you. Vice Chair Bethel, do you have? I do, thank you. So you mentioned the start of the fourth quarter is April 13th, and I understand that you're working through these two potential options, but you didn't really talk about dates. And I think it's important to try to share with the community what your plan is as far as communication with not just the models, but when you're gonna bring these students back regardless of which one is chosen. So is what's that process look like between now and the 13th of April. Yeah, sorry, I missed something really important that you said. You said I didn't talk about and then I couldn't hear. Um, 
I, I only had, I only heard you talk about or state the April 13th was the start of the fourth quarter. Um, I didn't hear, and maybe I missed it because my connection is really poor, uh, the delivery on between now and then, what's the communication plan? When do we want these kids back? Regardless of the model, parents are very eager to know, you know, what the process is. And I feel like we're not really telling them a whole lot other than the start of the fourth quarter is the April 13th date, which, okay. No, I apologize for moving through that information too quickly. Um, we're going to engage in the same type of communication process that we did with the elementary uh, families last month. Um, and so we will have uh, information videos about uh, what the what the models look like, how to get ready for um, for bringing students back for hybrid. At the same time, remember we're, we're ramping up our limited in person or we're really trying to expand it, right? So what, and that's gonna look different at SeaTac as it does at uh, Sprague, Northwest, or North, uh, South, uh, West Salem, et cetera. So um, we, we, and you make a really good point in that we need to um, ramp up our communication for what we're doing between now and April 13th because we do really plan to um, provide more supports to students. So I appreciate that feedback, Daniel. Or, our initial uh, planning, uh, Director right. Bethel. Sorry. Um, our initial planning with the comms team that we're looking at the third week of February, which is I think next week, um, as far as beginning to to talk about it with um, our secondary families. And uh, Sylvia's team has been meeting with the secondary team. Um, and this the hard part is um, not clearly having the model. Um, one of the things we want to really push in our community is the issue of um, riders registra registration for transportation, because the, the one of the huge inhibitors in, in all of this is transportation, not because we don't want to, and but it's a real um, bus challenge, driver challenge when you have to really expand the routes. So what we're trying to think about is how do we really push to say, if you can take your student, which is never our position, if you can take your student to school, take your student to school, because every bus seat we save um, helps us get further in the organization in order to um, uh, really have a um, viable option at the secondary. Um, one real example is um, CTEC is really thinking through how they can bring back their seniors. Uh, Principal Rhodes has a really good um, model for how to do it safely. Um, but the operational challenge is if we let seniors at SeaTech go and we transport them, now we're running a bus route into every area of the community for a few kids at the expense of other kids who might really need. So again, we're trying to think about as we communicate to those seniors, how many really need a ride? How many could we give a bus pass to? You know, If we can take it down to one, or two, that's different than if you need 50 kids from all over. So we're trying to push the system that way. And then the other thing at SeaTech is we set that up as our distribution for meals. So what are the operational implications of that as well? So that's, that's kind of how we're working through it. And really that push around for our elementary families, if you need a ride to school on a bus, sign up for riders registration because that information then feeds into our routing system software so we can effectively and efficiently route the um, route buses. Did I miss it? Anybody, uh, Dr. Hine, did you ask your question? Uh, yes, I think I already did. Uh, hopefully right. we're gonna be taking a break though. Yeah, we're gonna take a break. That's what I was gonna say, you know, I just want to throw a question and uh, you don't have to answer now, but sometimes if you can, you know, when kids start coming back with this long break from school, there's a lot of mental health surge, suicidal thoughts and struggles and emotional problems. We'll be, I, I anticipate there'll be a huge surge as we come. Uh, the question is, we have designed one day or the other day for counseling how are we going to plan for this surge in mental health needs and suicidal needs? Because you really cannot plan the crisis on the day when we are supposed to be there. So I'm just what kind of referral sources we need, what kind of connections we need with the county com community in order to take care of the surge that we will anticipate, both for students coming back and probably the faculty also will probably need a lot of help. 
just a thought. I don't think we will have time to answer that, but uh, somewhere in the next presentation. We'll that's take okay. about five minutes break if that's okay with everybody.